Hey, how you doing? Hey, good, Grayson. How are you doing? I'm doing good. So what's been going on in your neck of the woods, David? Oh, you know, it's been cold up here in Illinois, unfortunately, and uh, bees are hunkered down for the winter still. And tomorrow we're supposed to get another snowstorm. So uh, just uh, winter, I'm getting tired of winter, getting tired of gray skies, I'd like to get some yeah. sun. Yeah, same here. But, you know, we don't get that, you know, um, cold as temperatures, but still it's, you know, still I'd rather spring. But, oh, yeah, you know, we're not too far away. Yes, you know, only like a month or two away. So that's that's probably. Good. Yeah, probably around there. a little different for each person because you know, everybody just depending on what time your spring starts. But usually for us, it usually starts mid March, early March, something like that is when our spring starts. But, yeah, uh, for us, our spring usually starts uh, probably. uh we, we kind of like to think it starts in March, but it doesn't. We'll have some March warm up and people get excited. And then we'll have just terrible April cold weather for like two, three weeks sometimes. So usually the middle to late April is when we can start doing stuff in the hives. I get you. Because, you know, every time whenever you say, you know, it's going to be spring and March, you know, it's always like, you know, you may, there may be a, another two weeks where oh, I know. we have winter and you're like. <laughs> yep. It gets everybody off guard and stuff like that. So, yeah. But, you know. We can even have some weeks in February that are really warm and bees get flying. And it just looks like the middle of spring, a couple of weeks in February, like a February thaw. But then, you know, everybody starts saying things like, oh, we're going to have an early spring. Hey, look at February. And then we, you know. No, nah, it doesn't happen at all. And then we'll get a week like that in March, and all the beekeepers are like, yeah, it's going to be an early spring this year. Look how good March is. You know, I've had some March weather a lot warmer than April weather. That's how crazy it is. And here in Illinois, it seems like our our winter has, you know, it comes to an end. We have like five days of spring, then we go right into hot summer. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, like, especially whenever down here, whenever it was, like, December, it was, like, you know, like, we had 70, 60-degree weather. Yeah. You know, it would be warm for a little bit, and it, you know, got right down cold right oh, then, no. and, you know, kept caught most of us, you know, seven beekeepers off guard, because especially mm -hmm. that cold snap that we had a while back, you know, like, I know it probably, you know, hit you a little more worse, but for us, it was, like, 60-degree, you know, weather, so it was, like, yeah. pretty, you know, unnormal for us down here in Alabama, but, you know. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, that you know, that kind of weather, you know, because like whenever I say like, especially down here in Alabama, like beekeepers in southern states are not used to the cold weather while the, you know, people up, you know, in your, um you know, area are, you know, used to it. Yep. You know, yep. we're, yeah, we're used to it. Our houses are built that way. I, right. I talked to some of my friends in the south, you know, when that cold snap hit and a lot of them broke a lot of water pipes. Uh, you know, we we bury our water pipes three feet below the ground and any water that comes up into the house 
has to come up in uh, kind of like in the middle of the house and away from the outside walls. Uh, otherwise, our our pipes would freeze up at 20 below zero, you know. That's right. That's, you know, you always have that problem. But yeah, I guess, well, we better get to our, you know, we're going to we have a few topics for us to, you know, discuss. Okay, um, good. Um, I guess first one, I guess we can talk a little about before, you know, we get into of the big stuff. I guess we can yeah. talk about kind of how you started in, you know, beekeeping. Yeah. Because, uh, maybe just like simple, briefly share your story of how you kind of got into beekeeping if, you know. Go just brief if you could. Okay, sure. Um, I started probably the worst way anybody could ever start. And uh, <clears throat> I was living in Ohio at the time, north of Columbus. And there was a friend of mine who told me that a tree had fallen down in a storm and there were bees in it. And was I interested in starting beekeeping? And I was in my early 30s back then. And I said, sure, I'll do that. Uh, what, you know, what can it be like? So we proceeded over the next week to cut the bees out of this fallen tree. And they just ate us up every time running that chainsaw after them. I didn't know anything about bees. I mean, totally nothing except that they stung. But we finally got that comb out of there, you know, kind of tied it into some open frames and put it in a hive. That's how I got started. And uh, I lived in the middle of uh, an Amish community and they had clover everywhere. I mean, I, I produce so much honey. I just didn't have enough things to put my honey in. But I was brand new. I didn't know anything. This was like 1993 or 1994. You know, there were very few bee clubs in my area. There was no internet at all. There, there wasn't many books that I could read. There wasn't much at the time where I was. Compared to what it's like today, There, it was a it was just a desert of information <laughs> compared to what it is today with beekeeping and getting started. And uh, I stumbled around for a lot of years just trying to figure stuff out. Compare that to what people are, are, you know, privileged to have today getting started. You know, there's classes. I mean, there's books. There's, there's so many things like live streaming that you can just get on and get questions answered. My right. gosh, it, it wasn't like that at all when, when I started. So yeah, okay. I, I regret anybody that tries to start uh, the way I did it, buying a package and or a nuke and then buying a hive to put them in, taking a class. Boy, that's the way to get started for sure. Right. Especially because, you know, a while back, you know, we didn't have all that, you know, fa all this fancy stuff that we have now. Like, you know, we have live streams, we have YouTube videos, you know, you can search on YouTube how to start beekeeping. It pops right up. Oh, but, yeah. You know, a while back, you know, you, you all you had to do was, you know, you had to buy a book. You had to, oh, you know, yeah. bees. So That's I think, right. you know, now we're, you're privileged to have everything that we have right now. Yeah. And when YouTube started, you know, YouTube didn't really have the um, clarity that it has now. I mean, when it first started, it was just a place where a lot of people were putting family videos and, you know, goofy videos. It didn't have the sort of the scientific arm to it that it has mm -hmm. now, especially with bees. And I started on YouTube in 2008. And I'm not sure, I'd like to find out, I may be the longest running uh, beekeeping channel on YouTube. I've, I've researched it a little bit. Um, and I think Frederick Dunn started the same year I did, but I think he was about three months after I started before he started talking bees. I think he started chicken. So I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, that would be good bragging rights. The oldest and longest running beekeeping channel on YouTube. Yeah. If, if anybody can find that out, let me know. I mean, that'd be cool bragging rights, yeah. I guess. But yeah, back then I was just doing it. I actually was just blogging. I didn't know anything really. I was just, you know, learning about bees and kind of growing. And I just started blogging. Uh, I actually was writing a blog uh, way before I went on YouTube. And then I just finally, I started a video, um, uh, like a video channel on another platform before YouTube. But then when YouTube started, uh, I got onto that about two years later. So um, it's been a fun journey. And I've just kind of grown uh, right in front of everybody else on YouTube. I've just grown and they've watched me grow and get older. But it's been fun, it really has been. Yeah. My story on how I started uh, this YouTube thing was about a year ago. Like whenever I um started, you know, like um uploading videos, you know, I did was like shorts and stuff. I really didn't do any presenting or talking and all this stuff. 
but then yeah. like a, like a few maybe like nine eight months later i started to you know get in front of the camera do that kind of stuff and then to the point where you know to where i am today i've grown over those um last year yeah if i remember right 20 years like uh, a few months ago i was at 20 subscribers now i'm at free 80 i think is what it was yep i saw so, that you know, i've grown you know for the past few months and years so it's been you know fun mm -hmm. to do it so and you know the journey of it but that's kind well, of I, yeah i was gonna say you know it's amazing at, at your age and how you're already got you know this kind of uh good information you've you've already excelled at learning the platform and learning and kind of figuring things out at your age because really to be i guess successful on youtube if we want to call it that uh, it's all about showing up um, it's all about consistency and making a video again, making a video again. And as long as you keep doing that, you know, you can be an overnight success in 20 years. <laughs> I mean, it, it really does take time. Yes. I think we sometimes think, you know, we hear some people, a, a few people will get on YouTube and, you know, they'll be really <coughs> popular pretty quickly. But that's not the norm. That's that's the yeah. abnormal. But most of us just have to get on there and work hard at it year after year. Right. So you've already got a leg up. I mean, you're already on this and yeah. you've already got a lot of things going for you. And I think you're pretty excited about it. I, I can see you have a passion for it. I do. So uh, it's going to be fun for the beekeeping community to watch you grow and, and your brother, Vincent, uh, to be right. on YouTube. And, you know, you guys, you know, a lot of us won't live that long, but, you know, you'll be on uh, videos when you're 30, 35 years old. And you'll be showing videos like this one going, look at me here when I was this young, you know. <laughs> I get you. That's probably exactly what I'll do. Yeah. <laughs> it will be. Yeah. But, you know, like I've learned like, like, you know, whenever I started, I didn't know anything about editing all this, you know, because then I, you know, got into the thing, you know, I kind of learned how to edit and basic stuff. You know, I didn't yeah. know how to do thumbnails, but then I got to the point where I kind of, know how to do all this stuff like you know thumbnails editing all that you know live streaming so i think it's been a you know good journey to you know learn how to do but yeah it's uh yeah um knowing how to do photography and videography knowing how to edit and uh you actually i think every youtuber for the most part uh they're they're really movie makers everybody that makes a video has a storyline in their head. They have scenes that they want to capture. E even my videos that I make, uh, I, I spend a lot of time actually just making a movie. It might be an eight-minute movie or you know a thirty-minute movie, but I'm I'm spending a lot of time thinking: What do I want to say? How do I want to say it? What do I want? What do I want to present? And uh, all of those are good skills to have. It's their communication skills. You learn how to communicate um, through video and have a storyline that you want to communicate to people. Uh, it, I know sometimes it seems easy to just get in front of a camera and say what's on your mind and close it up. But um, to make it really what you want it to be and help people, there needs to be a, a lot put into it. And, and those are skills that, that I really think are very useful. And, and whether it's a, a, a YouTube channel or some other business in the future, um, media skills is really where it's at yeah i think the same thing because you know a lot of people like you know think that you know videoing is easy but for me whenever you know i was nervous at the first time you know uploading videos and you know because it's you know different you know being for even though you don't you don't have many people watching you as you're doing it but then you know you're in still front of the camera so it's a little different it is oh yeah it, you know yeah. everybody experience that whenever they do a, whenever they do a first you know youtube video or a uh, tenth for maybe their hundredth, you know, they'll realize and they'll, you know, still feel the same way about it, I think. Yeah, I've I've heard that uh I think the number one fear that people have is public speaking. And right. so, you know, people are oftentimes very uncomfortable speaking to a group of people. And I've I have spoken in front of people uh, about all my life, but I, I know that it's a lot easier for me to speak to a group of people than it is to speak to a camera because, you know, there's an interaction, there's a kind of a, a warm, more relationship based conversation when you're talking to a group, but you look in front of a camera. It's so hard to be natural when you're just talking to a lens. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. That's like 
I probably could talk easier, like on a stage to people or, you know, where you can inter interact, like you said, and yep. instead of being like in front of a camera, you know, there's nobody there, just a lens. But yeah. I think the same way. Yeah. But I guess we better get in our a few topics. I got a few topics for us. All right. So I guess the first one is one that's common that you've probably, that we all hear is the Varroa mite. Yeah. So I was wondering if we could, you know, just, I don't know what we can talk about it, you know, like to start it off, but, you know, anything like, you know, maybe just a few facts about the, you know, from okay. the end. You know, it, it's interesting because I'm going to make a video tomorrow where I really get in more to varroa mites. Um, I had some good study time today where I looked more into some of the problems that people are experiencing with varroa mites. And I thought I'm just going to make a video tomorrow and kind of explain it. But for me, when I started beekeeping, varroa mites had just kind of gotten a foothold and it was they weren't in my hives or anything yet, but you know, they quickly kind of spread and finally get, got caught up with me in my hives. And I think at that time I had two hives and gosh, I mean, those hives died so quick. It was unbelievable. And uh, then you start hearing all across the country what's going on and it's just breathtaking, you know, it's just unbelievable. But the, the varroa mite is, um, it's a devilish creature in that it just is a parasite that, you know, takes over a colony, it, it comes into a hive and begins to suck on the hemolymph, the fat bodies of the bees. And while it's doing that, it starts, uh, it has the reputation of spreading viruses through those dirty needles that it pierces the bees or the pupae with. And it's, it's just devastating because bees feed each other mouth to mouth and, you know, they're feeding the larvae with mandibular raw jelly from mandibular glands, those viruses start infecting the colony. And uh, you can imagine what it would be like during, you know, COVID if everybody fed each other mouth to mouth, you know, it would have wiped out yeah. all humans, but that's what bees are doing. And, and so these viruses are so hard on bees. When, when, uh, when they first came, uh, you know, we started throwing some big guns at them right off the bat, flu valvinate, kumafos, uh, very, very, very aggressive and dangerous chemicals at them. And that was what we got given to us and uh, to try to combat them at that point. But then there was wisdom that followed that beekeepers and science started saying, there's got to be something better because we started realizing a lot of these chemicals we were using had the potential to be absorbed into the wax. And that would actually cause queens and drones to be uh, sterile in reproduction. It would really hurt their reproductive organs. So we've started backing away and saying, how do we get off this chemical treadmill? I mean, you know, it's just like, it's it, at first it was this survival. How do we keep bees alive? Throw chemicals at them. And then everybody started reaching for anything, you know, whatever silver spoon that we could find that what would be the next thing that wouldn't be so dangerous and hard as chemicals and so over the years, there's, you know, there's been a lot of studies in science done and achieved, actually, uh, a, a great level of success with treatments, uh, not just, you know, natural treatments or synthetic treatments, but a lot of a lot of mechanical treatments like the green drone comb. And a lot of these things are showing that they do work. Now, they don't work on the level like you just can't put a dream drone, uh, drone comb in your hive and trap mites and all, all is over. Everything is done. Um, I think all of these methods that we have finally uh, sort of allowed to rise to the top, there's some that show that if we use them, um, not all at the same time, but we trade off or we try a, a whole bunch of these different tools that we have, then we can keep our mite levels relatively low. And, and so it works pretty well. Yeah, and for so. Yeah, there was a while that I got into trying to control it without any use of treatments at all. I was using uh, screen bottom boards and, you know, that's been shown to actually reduce mites to, I think, what most people would agree would be a small degree. And then we have green, green drone comb trapping. And so mites jump on the development of the drones because they're they're under the caps longer than a worker by three days. And so um, we use green drone comb. I started using, I, I don't know where I came up with the idea. I don't know if I heard it somewhere or it just uh, dawned on me or what, but long time ago, I came up with the idea 
that I could actually um, trap my or cage up my queen for a week. And then I would have success in reducing the mites because if you reduce the, the amount of brood by a week, say, you could actually uh, prevent more mites from developing in that, in that brood. It, it's kind of like uh, I realized that, you know, why were Africanized bees, Apis, Mellifera, Scutellata, why, why were they uh, having better luck fighting off mites than our bees? And so I realized they swarm so much that they were constantly breaking their brood cycle. And I was like, aha, I'm going to do that on my bees and see if that helps. That, that really does help a lot. But I'm like everybody else. I'll try all these things and they'll work sometimes really well. And then other times on other hives, it doesn't work so well. And you have to kind of bring out the big guns. And uh, But we do have a lot of treatments available like uh, Formic Pro, Apigard, Apivar. I mean, we have today a lot of things that when we keep trading them off and, you know, switching them out, they seem to do pretty good um, under our current um, mite impact. And Grayson, I think that, you know, I really, I, I have conversations with a lot of beekeepers and scientists and PhD entomologists. And some of those conversations sometimes go like, well, if we would have just not done anything, then maybe the bee, uh, bees could have, built up some sort of tolerance or resistance, ability to fight off mites. But by doing the way we're doing it, you know, we're just setting ourselves up for failure because the mites that do survive what we throw at them are super mites that keep getting worse and worse. And, uh, but all of that may have some merit, but it wasn't available. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be a thing because there was no way to get everybody in the country <laughs> just to sit back and watch, you know, billions and billions of bees perish because of mice. Yes. Yeah, it just wasn't something that was going to happen. You, we couldn't get everybody on. The, nobody was ever going to attempt that. It, it yeah. just had to be, what do we do? How do we kill them? That's right. Because, you know, I think bees, bees are, you know, one of the, you know, most crucial, you know, insects on our, you know, um, you know world. Because so you know, like if you know all of them perish, like you said, you know, like if none, nobody treats, nobody does anything, you know, then they're all numbers are gonna go dramatically, you know, down. So then you know, then the you know bees will keep on going down, down, you know, until you know. So I think you know same thing, but there are so many like you know whenever I started uh beekeeping, we didn't um treat either. We just try to stay natural as possible, but then you know mm -hmm. last. Last year, 2022, you know, we had some old apple bar strips laying around and I thought I might, I'd just go ahead and treat because, you know, I think treating may be the better side of it because, you know, keep them, keep the mites down, you know, that's, you know, real, you know, it's going to keep the bees healthy. So, you know, I, you know, started to treat and, you know, we're gonna, this year I'm going to treat even more, um, you know, get some more supplies for that kind of stuff. So, but, you know, we did kind of, kind of same, you know, similar story for us, you know, when we started mm -hmm. being, uh, to felt whenever we started beekeeping, it was like right before uh, COVID um, hit, um, yeah. right before then. And then, you know, we started beekeeping. We had like, you know, ups and downs sometimes, but then, you know, cause like, you know, a lot of bees died. So then that's when I thought, you know, maybe they're dying because of the row mites. So then that's when I started, you know, the treat. So that's, you know, that's kind of what happened. But um, yeah. now the next thing is to, this still relates to, you know, the uh, row mite is the treatments. Because, you know, you have Apivar, Formic Pro, Apigard, all these different OA. So I wonder if we could talk a little about what's your um, personal experience with all these and which one do you think may be the best of the choice of, you know, the selection? Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm wanting to get a little bit in that tomorrow in my video. Uh, you know, it's interesting, all these different treatments. Everybody that um, – I, I have a mentoring uh, – mentorship program where I, I, I mentor about 200 beekeepers. And – um, but others, in addition to my uh, B Team 6 team, uh, will ask me, please tell me, what should I do? You know, and I'll have YouTube comments where people will uh, leave a comment, right? And they'll say, hi, this is, you know, there's maybe not a name on their comment. This is Billy Bob 76. What, how should I treat my mites? Well, I have no idea where in the world they live. I don't know where on right. the planet they exist. I don't know if they're in Australia. I don't know if they're, you know, in California or up north somewhere. I don't know. So there's no way that there, there's not a recipe. 
I don't think that, you know, you go to the doctor and you have strep throat or something and he might uh, give you 500 milligrams of amoxicillin. You know, that's that's pretty much a recipe for knocking out a bacteria. But you, you take something like a mite in a colony uh, and, you know, it's a super cell organism that's this, you know, how, how do you decide on a treatment, you have to first test for mites and see what your levels are at. And based on that, then you're going to, then you have to ask yourself, what's my temperature range? And then you have to ask yourself how much brood is in the hive because how you treat them with some of these uh, treatments are based on temperature, uh, amount of brood in the colony, the time of year it is. And so there's no way to give an answer that is going to be like the the magic thing for everybody. I I really, I think the answer is going to be if each beekeeper can really understand the life cycle of the mite, and then they can understand, they need to know every single uh, method available to them. And it doesn't take that much time. You can grab any of these big beekeeping companies, magazines, they usually have a section on treatments and they'll, they'll have a section there with Apigard, Apivar, Forming Pro, uh, all, all the things that are out there today, OA. And they will basically have a description in there, which ones you can use with honey supers on or off, you know, and temperatures. And then you just have to, if you have to make some index cards and put each of those on there and write down, uh, oh, you can quickly say, I can't use this one with honey supers on, or I can't use this one if it's over 85, 89 degrees. So I have to find the right temperature. So um, I, I think all that said, I, I think for me, what I try to do is I'll use the simple things like green drone comb trapping. And then I'll also, most of my hives have screen bottom boards. And then I'll also uh, break the queen's brood cycle in the months of July, August, and September for seven days. Now, what's important to me is I have to get my mite levels almost down to zero around July or August before I start raising bees of winter physiology. Where I live, I got to have bees of winter physiology. It's, it's a really uh, interesting thing that bees can actually raise bees in late summer, early fall that will live four to six months. Uh, they're different. And so these bees of winter physiology, I can't allow them to be parasitized by mites. And okay. so if, the, if I can reduce my mites. Now, what I've learned, uh, Grayson, is if I can get a way ahead of the game, because a lot of times we don't realize what's going on here. But so we have these mites in our hive and oftentimes beekeepers only think of a mite as a, what it is, it's just a bug, it's a mite, an insect. But more than that, it is a spreader of these viruses that's hurting my bees. So if I wait too long and I allow these viruses to be in my bees, then what happens is even if I kill the mites in the fall, I may have had too high of mite counts maybe in June, for example, or July. Before I get to the fall, I'm fighting a losing battle with the viruses. You know, I can't, I can't stop the viruses. And so even though I reduced my mites, say, if I, you know, played ignorant and I finally burned off my mites in September, uh, these viruses live on in the bees beyond me killing my mites. So what I've tried to do, I've sort of backed the whole thing up and I said, wait a minute, I need to start killing mites as soon as I can get in my hive in the spring. And I need to keep my mite levels one to 100 bees or no more than three mites per 100 bees all year long. That will help me reduce my viruses in my colony. So I won't be trying to uh, just, you know, be found with all these mites that are spreading the viruses, I can hold my viral level down, the virus load. So that's what I've been, I feel like real successful in achieving. Now, do I have 100% success in that? Absolutely not. There are some times that I, uh, last year I had a hive or two that I was throwing everything at and I couldn't get the mite levels down. It was just, it was insane. Um, I threw Formic Pro, I threw Apivar at them. And I, I had a hard time getting my levels down on uh, two specific hives. I don't know if it was just the, um, the batch of product that I was using or uh, what, but 
everything else responded normally like it normally does and real well. So I, I don't feel that personally I have to worry about mites, but it, they all do. Occasionally they all will come and bite us, even though we are doing everything we can because of the, of the viruses, even though, and, and there's sometimes I've had high mites in the hive and those, hi, those hives done really well. They don't, they're not dying from viruses. They, some of those mites aren't, strong transmitters or carriers of viruses. So it's not always, not always an indication of how the hive's gonna do based on how your, what your mite levels are, but we know that if you have high mite levels, you're gonna have a higher chance of having more viruses, so we have to respond. That's right. I think the same, everything that you said, you know, about, um, you know, the bromite, cause you know, keep it down, especially for the winter bees physiology, like you said that, you know, they live four to six months. I've talked about this on my channel before, Good, um, old good. videos uh, about the Varomai, about because you know the winter bees has about four or six months, you know, average, you know, to get you through, you know, those cold months, and then right whenever you know spring, mid spring, you know, then those bees will start dying, and then the bees will probably start raising, you know, the other, you yeah. know, summer bees, and then the, do that process each year. So then whenever the Varomai comes in, you know, transmits their, um, you know, their, their viruses whenever they transmit all those virus through the bees they're feeding from you know bee to bee mouth to mouth so then you know then that will split those you know the winter bees into their lives into half instead of three to six months maybe um can't really say two to three maybe four you know it doesn't really get you through you know all those you know good you know all those cold months they'll die sometime in january maybe late february so i think you know yeah, that's the thing. yeah. So, well, that's right. If you if you have uh, if you have mites, you know we've always thought of bees, and some of the literature suggests that uh, bees will die only live half their life if they're uh, if they receive viruses from these mites that they only live half their life. And if you project that out and and say that's true, then you look at your winter physiology bees raised in October. You would expect them to make it through November, December, January, February, March, April. But then if they do have a high virus load, they're going to live half their life. Then you're only going to get into January and February. And that's what seems to be reported, and especially in the north, where the cold weather, I mean, being cold is, is working against bees already. But um, you'll, you'll hear beekeepers say, my hives are really strong. They were doing good up until about February or even March sometimes. You know, they almost make it. And they just run out of population, uh, just right. stay warm. Too many bees are dying. They can't stay warm. Where I live, we need about 40,000 bees uh, in a hive to make it through the winter. If we start dropping below that number, um, we can do some things like wrapping them and things to, if they drop low like that. But uh, just left on their own, they're going to have a hard time. And oftentimes, if, they, if you do overwinter a colony here where I live, uh, below 40,000 bees, um, you can come out of winter with just 10,000 bees that barely made it, right? That's right. And uh, that's only a package. So you're essentially starting over. And that's why I decided years ago that I was going to feed my bees heavily and I was going to force them to raise brood, heavy amounts of brood all winter long. And I know not everybody likes that concept. Not everybody likes that idea. Everybody, some people will say that that, that presents a lot of issues and, and it does. I mean, um, I raise a lot of brood. In fact, my bees are at their biggest number. Generally speaking, they're largest uh, during the winter for me because Bees of winter physiology don't die. And in, in the summertime, when I'm when I'm having a lot of brood being reared, it only lives 30, uh, 45, uh, 30 to 45 days. So every bee that's born in the season, there's bees dying. Now they're being replaced, but you have this huge die out. But when I start raising bees, I found in, in the fall, forcing them to raise more bees, I can have gigantic colonies all winter long. Sometimes they don't even cluster. We, we can take pictures of them with thermal cameras and they're not even clustered. They're so hot in there. That's right. and, but the problem that it uh, gives is if you have that many bees <laughs> is that sometimes for us, they, they swarm before we can ever get <laughs> warm enough uh, or kind of in the mood to, to do anything about those swarms. You know, they can start swarming in March and April and it's not, it's still cold snaps. Right. And then the other thing is the more, uh, seasons of generations that you have, uh, the more generations you have in a, in winter, the more mites you're going to have. And, right. and and I just don't make any effort 
haven't yet, I've thought about it, but I haven't made any effort yet to treat uh, my bees in the wintertime. Yeah. So that's, you know, two things. But I decided long ago, it's better to come out of winter for me with a lot of bees because we make nucleuses, you know, and we, no, we need a lot of bees. And, and when, the, when I get come out of winter, I'll deal with the swarming, I'll quickly make splits, and I'll start working on getting those mite levels down. So I'd rather do that than barely scrape out of winter with 10,000 bees and try to, you know, spend a month getting, getting them built up back up to a reasonable number. That's right. I think the same, you know, thing. Because, you know, especially, you know, for a lot of bees, you know, I think a lot of bees is actually pretty good. But, you know, sometimes, you know, they will swarm because they're so big, you know, they, and then it'll get cold, you know. But then oh, yeah. I, think, I think, you know, high numbers of bees, you know, are real good for going into your winter because, you know, you have more bees I means bigger clusters. So I think, you know, yeah. it's good to have more bees, you know, because, you know, a lot of people will, you know, will say, like, don't raise too much brood or, you know. I think, you know, a lot of it's personal, you know, um, preference and stuff like it, that. It really is personal preference. It's personal philosophy. And and some people don't have the interest or the time or energy to play with bees that are really big, you know, all winter long. Because right. I have to feed them. I, I have to give right. them about, uh, I'm feeding all my colonies probably uh, at least four pounds of both protein and carbohydrates all winter long a week. Yeah. So every week these colonies are getting four pounds and they're eating all four pounds. Some of them, some of them eat more, some less, but so that's a lot of work. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to keep feeding them, you have to keep making my, I make the winter be kind. So we have to keep feeding the, the winter be kind to these bees. And a lot of my videos, I show that, but um, that just allows them to make more brood. They, when, when they eat and they have a lot more of the carbohydrates and protein in them, they're able to stay warmer uh, while they eat. They're just, just like us. When we eat, we get warmer. We get hot when we eat. So um, it, it's good. I, I first made the winter be kind because I had a moisture problem in all my colonies and I wanted to, some way to absorb the moisture. And I tried a bunch of things, but I also wanted to feed my bees. So then I had read some old literature of candy boards from the 1800s. And I thought, gosh, is there a way I can make a, a candy board with protein and minerals in it that I could put on a hive that would absorb the moisture, the excess moisture. Um, and the bees don't really need a lot of moisture in, in the winter, but they do need moisture around any the queen laying brood. So they do need some moisture. But so we played around with the recipe for a couple of years and got it where that uh Winter bee kind could absorb that moisture, which makes the food more uh, pliable, more edible for the bees to consume once the moisture hits it. That's right. That worked out good. That's good. Oh, we got a question real quick. Um, are they working on a way for beekeepers to see if we have any of the viruses that can be transmitted? Um, there's a lot of work being done. That's a good question. I'm not sure if I totally understand it, but... Um, if, if they're asking about viruses on honeybees, they've been heavily studied for many, many years, long time, long before uh, the Varroa mite. Uh, we had viruses and, you know, and so these viruses and how they affect bees. Uh, I was at the Beltsville, Maryland Bee Lab um, about a year ago, early 2022, and uh, a lot of work being done there on finding uh basically finding a way to combat the viruses that bees have. But bees have so many viruses uh, that they potentially can have to deal with upwards of a dozen to two dozen viruses that bees can contract. So that, yeah, I'm not a virologist. I'm not a specialist on viruses or anything. Uh, right now, it's just as hard, I think, with in humans to combat viruses compared to what we can do with bacteria, for example, you know, and honeybees have bacteria like American fowl brood and European fowl brood. And we can, uh, some States allow you to, to deal with that, but uh, other States with ABF, I mean, AFB, you have to just burn them. But I, I would say viruses are tricky. You know, they're, they're not as easy to deal with as bacteria infections. So I think one day we'll be better at it, but it's that's a tough one to deal with viruses and bees. Yeah, I think it's you know real difficult. We have one more question here, and then I'm gonna we're gonna get to next topic. Okay. Um, sorry if I missed it, David. What do you treat with? Oh, I think I I think I miss. Oh, you missed it. Yeah. Um, like I said, I try to use 
no treatments as long as I can. I base everything on my mite counts. Every, every 30 days, I think beekeepers need to do an alcohol wash or a soapy sud wash, a dawn wash, and determine how many mites you have. And then based on that, you should formulate your own plan of treatment based on your own philosophy. And so you might be uh, chemical free. You may not want to use chemicals. And that way you're going to use things like a screen bottom board, green drone comb for mite uh, trapping. You're going to break the queen's brood cycle, powdered sugar dusting, and then retest again to see if any of those things worked. And if you see that they are having an effect, you can up the amount of time that you're using your powdered sugar dustings. I've heard people that say they've had really good success doing that once a week, so on. And, but if you find you can't do anything, that the mites are uh, just running ahead of you on, on your, let's call them natural treatments, <laughs> then I like to go for the big guns. I like to pull out Formic Pro. I, I started using Midaway Quick Strips, you know, many years ago. And then uh, I like the Formic Pro. Uh, maybe it's called Formic Pro 2. I don't remember, but I, I like Formic Pro. Formic Pro gives you the ability to blast mites, you know, for about a week. I mean, it just burns them um, and it, it will kill the mites really effectively. It's not so much, and it kills below the caps. And that's what's really neat. I think it's the only method that will kill mites below the cap cells where a lot of them are living actually. And so a lot of the other methods only kill the mites above the caps, that's why they're longer. They're 42 day treatments because they're hoping to get three cycles of the bees coming up out of the cells and they can hit the like Apigard again or Apovar again. So a lot of these treatments, you have to keep treating them a long period of time where Formic Pro, you can blast them once and knock all the mites out, most of them. Um, so Formic Pro is a good one for me. And I do like, probably my favorite after that would be Apigard. Yeah. Um, so all those are, you know, good. Like, like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, on temperatures, like for me, uh, you know, we each yeah. day I talked to, you know, you talked about it, you know, I've been seeing it, you know, about fluctuating temperatures, you know, not just in the winter, you know, we can have that in summer sometimes like, you know, real hot days. And then we'll go yeah. down maybe nineties for, especially down here in the South, yeah. you know, um, you know, we'll have fluctuating temperatures, you know, like if we used Apigard, you know, eat one dose for such and such temperature and, you know, yeah. Yeah, so, you have to cut it know, back if it's hot. Yep. So then, you know, for down in South, you know, I'd probably, I'd probably, you know, go with probably Apivar, maybe, you know, just, you know, depending, probably want to treat to make sure it works, you know, test mm -hmm. me, test mm -hmm. to make sure it works. But I think, you know, same thing. Yeah. So I guess next uh, topic is um, one that we were kind of a little bit um, going into, but not fully is feeding. Um, you know, I feed a little bit. I know you feed. Um, I wonder if you could kind of explain to us about, you know, more, you know, you know, a, a little bit more facts about yeah. feeding. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on feeding and I've found that when I look into the science of feeding bees and I look through oh, a lot of literature that's been written, even in the past with DeGroote in the 50s, writing his work on uh, proteins that, that bees uh, need to have um, and understanding a lot about how bees work and how, the, how their systems will process nectar, carbohydrates and proteins and the pollen and such, um, I became aware that when bees consume nectar, uh, they are also receiving the protein of the, of the uh, pollen. So they go to the flower, they suck up this nectar. They're, they're also getting the pollen in honey, in the nectar before it becomes honey. And we know this because if you look, if you sample your honey, uh, you'll see that there's pollen grains in the honey if you put it under a microscope. And that's what honey is. Honey is a, is a nectar uh, from, from flowers that the bees add their enzymes to. They, they uh, change it into honey by drying it out, adding enzymes to it. And um, when, it's, when it's honey, it has these uh, tiny particles of, of pollen in it. Well, when a bee consumes their honey, or their nectar, they're actually consuming these grains of, of pollen, which are protein for the bees. So I think sometimes we don't realize that bees need protein. And oftentimes we always just think of bees needing to be fed sugar water. Bees need sugar. Look how they're going after the sugar. Well, when a bee goes to a flower, I think they instinctively know they're getting their balanced diet. 
I mean, they will go to other things for minerals, but you know, for the most part, they go to flowers. And so I just believe they, they know that when they consume that nectar, they're also getting the, the pollen that passes through their honey crop, through their proventriculus and into their mid, uh, into the gut where it can be absorbed in the, absorbed in the walls and all. So I decided I'm going to test this out. I'm going to put a little uh, protein powder in my sugar water, mix it up and what I thought would be about the equation, the, the equal amounts that you would have in nectar. And I saw a dramatic uh, improvement in my bees because I was wrestling with pollen patties. I, I started getting a small high beetle a lot. Uh, and, the, you know, they love those pollen patties. And I found trying to find a way to get protein in my bees. So I started putting protein in my sugar water and it was just, remarkable. I, I could, I didn't do any of the really scientific studies with control hives or anything. I don't, I don't really go that direction. I'll leave that up for the scientists and the entomologists to practice that out. But for me, I was just like, I'm going to put three jars out in my yard. I'm going to put one, one to one sugar water. And I'll put one out with one to one of sugar water with a little bit of honeybee healthy in it. Not as much as the label requires. I think it wants a teaspoon, a quart or something. I, I just put a little bit less than that. And then I made a compound of Sugar water, one to one, honey be healthy, um, about half of what they asked for uh, on the label. And then I put in about a teaspoon of protein powder in that quart jar. And I let them out in the, I just left them out in the field to see which ones uh, worked better. And oh my gosh, the bees all went for the ones that had the protein powder, the uh, same amount of honey be healthy, and same amount of sugar water. So that extra protein, something about it, it really was the magic answer for me to feed my bees protein a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of protein in that sugar water. So everything a bee eats, they eat through a straw. You know, bees don't really chomp down on steaks yeah. like, like we do. They eat through a straw. So they're trying to suck up these proteins. People ask me, well, if they, if they eat everything through a straw, how are they, getting, how are they eating this uh, pollen patty? Well, you know, they do, they can chew a little bit. They chew wax and they can chew things a little bit. But um, a lot of times if you watch bees, uh, they prefer to use their tongue to consume. I think that's, that's what they're made to do. They're made to eat through a straw. <laughs> so I wanted to figure out a way I could get more protein in that straw, their proboscis. Yeah. I know it's technically not a, an exact straw, but the proboscis would allow yeah. them to suck up the nectar. So I went down that road I, and I'm still there. I'm still feeding my bees. Uh, I raise bees winter physiology right. by overfeeding them um, a, a spring diet. And that makes the queen lay a lot more brood. And then I feed that same solution in a candy board all winter long and it makes them raise more brood. Yeah, I think same thing. Cause you know, whenever I, you know, when I was using some pollen patties a little bit, I forgot, like, you know, like last year, like right in the fall, around fall, and, you know, I was looking, you know, I was watching them eat it and they're using their proboscis, you know, because they just prefer to use their proboscis, you know, and also another yeah. thing that I think another thing that the um, pollen patty does have is a little liquid, I think. It is. That's you right. Because yep. then, you know, it has a little liquid mixed into it so then the bees can, you know, yeah. kind of consume That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it's got a lot of sugar mixed in it as well. That's right. So they can do that. I mean, we, we see That's them scrubbing, hard. they scrub the front of the hive with that proboscis, you know. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. They use that proboscis. It's one of their, you know, things that they like to use. But yeah, yeah, I think same thing, you know, you know about the feeding and all that stuff. But yeah, but I yeah, guess I, you know, I was going to say, I was gonna say you know, I, I found that, uh, that that bees really like sugar. I mean, that seems to be a really good yes. thing for them, and and uh, I, I think it's. I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of larger beekeepers uh, have to, or have chosen to use uh, fructose corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. Um, and some have chosen not to anymore. Um, but fortunately I don't have, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of colonies that I have to feed, but um, the ones that I do feed that I, I just like to give them sugar, sugar water, just regular cane sugar. Yeah. I think the same thing. Cause you know, I've heard, you know, some people use you know, corn fructose syrup, and then some, you know, kind of stick, you know, what was a different, you know, thing to, you know, do it. So, you know, I've heard the, you know, that play out as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know it's all, all mixed, you know, you know, ideas of uh, opinions of, you know, different things. But I think feeding is a good thing to stimulate the queen to lay more brood. 
That's mm-hmm. what, that's like you're saying, you know, if the, you know, because bees like uh, sugar. So mm-hmm. I don't, so whenever you're feeding the sugar and you're with, you know, how to be healthy, you know, you could put some protein in there, you know, give them some protein while they're eating, you know, yep. the sugar. So I think it's the same way. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. There, there, there's a, you know, I like what you said. Every beekeeper has their own opinion in their own way that they have found that things seem to work for them. And as much as we like to think that I want everybody to do what I do, it may not work for everybody. Right. In fact, it may not work for me forever. My, you know, it's interesting how some of these things we do for a while and then all at once they're not as effective as they once were. And so we have to kind of keep changing up a little bit. Uh, it's, it's the same way with our human body. I mean, we, we, we can, um, find benefits that from different food or different exercise that we use or, or use and all at once, uh, maybe our bodies change and all at once we have some kind of an allergy to a certain food that we used to really love to eat. That was good for us. Now we're allergic to it, or maybe we can't yeah. exercise from a pulled muscle. We're always having to kind of change our plans to, to reach a, a goal. And I think, uh, beekeepers have to be smart enough to say, you know, I, I need to realize that this may not always work and I need to be able to realize, uh, okay, this isn't working. Let me try something different. now. Everything that I do now came out of something that worked for a minute, but then it didn't for a while. So okay. I just, the things that I'm doing for a long time are the things that have worked for a long time. <laughs> I don't know if they yeah. always will. And I'm like, but I, I want to say also that I, I think some of the smartest beekeepers uh, Grayson are the ones who have tried things and they have failed, failed miserably and had to figure out what happened, why did it happen and how do I keep it from happening again? I, I like a beekeeper that, that can admit I've lost a lot of hives trying this way. I've lost some that way. And, but I just kept pulling myself up and trying a different thing. And this is working now a beekeeper that has never had an issue and never had to deal with European foul brood or American foul brood, never had to deal with this isn't working anymore, then they haven't really gained some of the, the knowledge that you learn from struggle. Uh, yeah. you know, some of the greatest things we learn come out of our times of struggle. Some of the greatest inventions, I think, are struggling. You know, I imagine people didn't like struggling with horses. And so yeah. now we drive a car and Probably cars couldn't get us where we wanted to go. So somebody struggled with cars being limited. We got an airplane now. So mm-hmm. I, I think all these things that we're talking about, it's it really should be that we're constantly being open minded, even with our own selves. And we're honest with ourselves to say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm happy sometimes when I can admit I I once thought this way, you know, I wanted to keep bees naturally, but that didn't work for me. I, I thought it would. I tried everything. I, I gave it a good try for years. I was capturing queens out of barns that were survival stock. You know, they haven't been treated or anything. I thought I could raise from uh, queens from that queen and I'd have the same results, but that didn't work that way either. I couldn't make that happen. Yeah. I think, you know, most of everything that comes out of, you know, beekeeping knowledge is, you know, through mistakes, you know, everything. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. you know, yeah. like, you know like once you make a mistake, you know, maybe try something different and then see if that one works. If that, if that one doesn't work, you know, good to know everyone. If that one works for a little bit, keep on trying that one. And if it works good, if it, you know, doesn't work and you have to try something different. So I think, you know, that's another thing, especially um, with, you know, whenever I was, you know, um, well, a few years ago, I was, you know, I accidentally split it too early, you know, then it kind of got to the point where I knew, oh, this is the time where I need to split. I don't need to split too early, you know, for my, you know, from, you know, down here in Alabama, you know, if I split too early, you know, it may go, you know, we may have a cold snap, you know, yeah. especially like in the spring. So then, you know, then the little colony dies, uh, it's, you know, yep. we split, dies, and, you know, then that's a mistake. But then you can also learn from it. You know, you can say, well, don't oh, need yeah. to split too early. I need to, I need to, you know, like keep on trying. And then once I find the sweet spot, you know, that's, you know, kind of where I want to split at. So I think if, you know, a lot of things like, you know, queen ring, you know, most of everything be keeping that, you know, that you might make a mistake on, you know, you'll learn from it. So I think, you know, same thing, you know, exactly. Yeah. You know, you, you look at uh, Thomas Edison. I mean, he went through, I think someone said 1200 different uh, filaments or material to use for a light bulb. And, you know, he, yeah. uh, he, I, I think he never felt defeated. I think he felt like he, every time he, uh, something didn't work, he just, he, he, he was glad he found that, okay, that's not going to work. Let's try something else. And so he could have looked at 1,200 failures 
that, you know, would have put him out of business, but he just kept getting more information every time he failed to what would be a better product to put in that light bulb to burn longer. So, and it's like uh, with beekeeping as well, like when, when you fail at something, um, you could chalk it up as a failure and get negative and get discouraged, but you could also use it as a data point. You could use it as information to give you insights in, into the bees themselves. Like, why didn't the bees respond this way? What was it about splitting too early that was bad for the bees? I, I've done the same thing, Grace, and I've split too early in the early days. And uh, I got several of my splits, they got chalk root really fast. Well, you know, it's just not enough bees in there. They, It was too early of a split. They got cold. You get chilled brood. You get potential for things to develop like chalk brood or chilled brood. So it's like, okay, I got to get it warmer. So I just started going by uh, listening to gardeners around here. And they were like, oh, we never plant anything until Mother's Day. You know, that's about the, what, the middle of May or something. So I started using the first of May as I'll never split until after the first of May. Yeah, I think, you know, like you just said, like, you know, you split right after May or, you know, around that time, you know, fruit, you know, you have to make a once you make that mistake and then you get to that, you know, sweet spot, like I said, then, you know, that's when I'm supposed to split, you know, because it's all different in each person's yeah. place, you know, like yeah. for us, you know, just, you know, all depends. But I think, you well, know, exactly. here's a great thing I, I, to this is exciting for me to talk about, because one of the greatest ways to get the recipe, like people want a recipe for treatment. People will ask me, what's the recipe of splitting? When should I split? They want a date, right? They want a date. Well, let's don't take dates because that changes with the various seasons and the activities of bees. Let's, let's look and understand the biology of the colony. So when you see that the colony is starting to raise uh, swarm cells, for example, okay, that's when you should make your splits. Because the bees are telling you whatever sources they're using, temperature, sunlight, length of days or whatever, the bees have decided now's a good time for us to split and reproduce and make a, another hive through a swarm. Well, that's bingo. That's when we should go out there and start making splits. We're safe to do that. You know, so that's kind of the way I raise queens. When my colonies uh, are at that time when they're wanting to raise queens, that's the most optimal time for me to start raising queens. If I want to get ahead of the game and raise queens before the, bee, the bees naturally do, uh, I'm not going to have the quality of queens, uh, you know, because I'm not going to have enough nurse bees or enough royal jelly or enough warmth in the hive for those queens to develop. And, and that's what happens sometimes. I think we, I think sometimes people get queens from places that they've jumped a gun on it and the, the queens may not be as mated as well. Or, or sometimes the drones, um, drones have to be well fed and uh, the drones uh, are fertile as soon as they're born. And so they're able they're you know, at that point they need to be well fed. So sometimes our drones are at fault. Like the queen may be ready to mate with drones, but the drones sperm is just not as what it should be too early on if they're yeah. raised in a colony where they weren't fed well in development. I think the same thing, you know, all that. And I guess the um, next thing that I guess we can talk about is something that's uncommon, but once you get it, it's not good. It is American foul breed. I yeah. know you've talked a little about that. So I wonder if we could, you know, talk a little about American foul breed and your experience with it. Fortunately, that. I have no experience with it. I've seen it in some labs and I've, I've, I've not seen it uh, actually in a hive that I've ever worked before. Um, but I have, you know, we've had to look at American foul brew frames when I was uh, taking my master beekeeper test with, with uh, Eastern Apicultural Society. So I know what it smells like. I know what it looks like. Um, and I've studied it. You know, it's, it's a, a, back, a, brood bacteria, a brood bacteria and it is the highly contagious and it is very dangerous and we don't want something like that to spread. Um, there are ways I think that we feel that we can reduce the chance of getting it by changing out your frames more often. Don't let them get extremely old because some of those spores of American foul brood can harbor themselves in between the layers of cocoon in the brood nest area. Every time a, a generation of bees is raised in the brood uh, frames uh, that developing brood makes a cocoon and 
uh, in development. And so there's walls and walls and walls and walls of cocoons after a while. And if you leave them in there long enough, you have a lot of walls <laughs> and the, the cell gets smaller actually. Yeah. But I, th I think we pretty much know that if we can keep a cleaner hive, that we can reduce our chances to some degree. So I think beekeepers, uh, that's why I think a lot of times we might conclude that hobbyists don't see it as often as commercial beekeepers do. Um, it could be because commercial beekeepers need to keep their combs uh, longer because of the number of colonies they have where a backyard beekeeper could change out three to five frames every year out of a hive that's really old and put new ones in. So there are a few things that we can do, but I, I think the most important thing would be to watch for it. And once you see it, take action immediately. That's right. Because it, it can spread because those spores are just so tiny and can be spread so easily. And, um, it's, 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 you know, we think that spores can be washed with bleach or, you know, we can use some way to leave them out in the sunlight or something, but you just can't. It, that's not a way. You can only kill it with fire, a very sure. hot fire. And so uh, and not really killing it, but you're destroying it. And all so your, uh, all your equipment that, that hive was. Yeah, you lose everything. Yeah, I mean, but but you have to look at it like if, if you have a hive that had American fowl brood in Illinois, you have to burn the bees and the hive and everything. And, uh, but that's, that's a good thing because you're preventing it from spreading in to upper colonies. Yeah, absolutely. It's, but, you, know, just this, you know, stop the spreading. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's really the main reasons that a lot of States have apiary inspectors that go around. They have a program. It, it's largely to prevent these highly contagious uh, diseases like American fowl brood. And uh, they'll look at other things, but, you know, really on their mind is, <laughs> you know, is this, is a brood area okay? Yeah. And that's what I always like to look for too. What does my brood look like? I, I can pretty much go into a hive and look at it real quick. And I mean, my, my uh, mental, my mental ability to assess a hive for brood disease is, is really good. I mean, I, I have had European fowl brood uh, years ago and, you know, I kind of got educated and, and well um, suited to handle that. And what do you do with that? Um, a lot of different ways you can handle that. And you can treat that in most states with a antibiotic. Now it's under a, a vet prescription, but um, there's a lot of ways you can do it naturally as well by changing out the queen or throwing a, a swarm on it, giving the nurse bees uh, opportunity to clean it up a little bit better if that works. So, but yeah, I know there we're, you know, we're seeing that there's a vac uh, there's a vaccine coming out for American fowl brood, the potential for that. And I made a video on that on my YouTube channel. I was really shocked by the comments. Um, the comments, uh, it leaned heavily toward the people, beekeepers that are not interested in it. Yeah. Um, there, there were group, I, I would say, I, I could categorize the comments this way. Uh, there were a small group of commenters that, of beekeepers that said, I would never use it. You know, it's, it's threatening. We don't know their outcome. We don't know the repercussions, blah, blah, blah. There was other people in the middle of the, uh, of both saying that, well, I'd rather not have to use it, but I don't want to get American fowl brood either. What's it going to cost? How's it going to be administered? What happens if my queen dies? You know, that's group that's interested, but once all their questions answered. And then there was the other group that said, oh my gosh, I, I would use it in a minute. I think it's yeah. great. So it's always going to be that way. I mean, we saw that with COVID-19. I mean, it's just, you know, even today there are parents that don't like to give their children vaccines or maybe not until they get older. And I think we just have to understand that we're always going to be in that sort of a place where some people don't want to be a part of medicine or science. They're trying natural ways and they think natural. A lot of people will say, well, it's always worked this way before mankind showed up. So mm -hmm. you know, how can bees just, why, why do we have to do all this stuff now? And, there were, and we're never going to ever reach a, a happy medium where everybody takes the same position on this. Yeah. Uh, there's no way. I, I would say this though, if I was a company that was, working on this product of a vaccine for American fowl brood, um, I would be very alarmed that the number of beekeepers are not, aren't interested in it and are speaking very negatively about it. And so I, if I was, if I had the ability as a company, I would, I would find some people that I could uh, be ambassadors for the vaccine 
to start sharing information about why it's important. And maybe they are, I, I just not, I don't follow it. So maybe that's what they're doing, but I haven't, it hasn't hit me yet. I haven't seen anything that uh, has come to across my desk saying that here's the value that this could have. Um, but until we do that, I think beekeepers are going to be suspicious of it, or at best they're going to be questionable about how it all plays out in, in the field. That's right. I think the same thing. Um, but and, yeah, and we, should be, and we should be, we have a, we have an obligation to really think, wait a minute, what happens if, you know, what, what yeah. if this happens? Uh, um, you know, what, how do we know this isn't going to be this way? I don't know. It's just, and again, I'm not somebody that studies viruses, uh, but there's so many questions I have about it that I don't know how I could ever get those answered <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I, I saw someone leave a comment that that was along the line of if we if we have these bees that have the vaccine and they're not they're not going to succumb to American foul brood, does that allow the American foul brood to be present and growing, but that the bees just aren't succumbing to it? And so is that what we want? So there's a lot of angles that people are taking that need to be given a lot of thought about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever I, um, like I said, you know, I've never seen American fabric in um, my colonies because, you know, haven't, I, don't, I haven't had the colon that long. You know, I've had ha I've had it for, you know, a little bit, but, you know, probably not long enough for the spurs to, you know, yeah, start building up because, you know, but I haven't seen it. So, you know, I've, but, but that's a good thing, you know. Yeah, yeah it is. I think that you right. know, have it, but, you know, once you get it, then you're like, oh, you know. Yeah. But, you know, once you get it, you know, it's just nothing you really can do. You have to, you know, kill everything, get the, you know, mm -hmm. so it doesn't spread because once it spreads and if you have like, you know, all your colonies die, you know, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be bad. You know, whenever you have like, you know, big old dead out. You know, all your <laughs> yeah. spreads out. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in with compassion, we feel sorry for the beekeepers that have had it. A lot of them have lost uh, either their only hive or they've lost a lot of hives in commercial operations from it. So, you know, with compassion, we have to feel like, boy, there needs to be an answer. And so if scientists are working to solve answers, I'm, I'm glad they are working on it. I mean, everything that we enjoy today in the medical fields that are a result of people that, well, you take polio. There's, you know, people, especially children were dying from polio or being crippled polio, but then there was a vaccine. And so lives were saved. And that's just, that's powerful when you stop and think about how how that can help us. So it's good that that's there. I, I'm one that, uh, you know, I, I was always vaccinated in school. And, um, so, you know, I felt like, um, I'm not, you know, right now I'm old enough to need a shingles vaccine and get a flu shot for a flu vaccine. I don't always do that like I should, but I, I'm glad it's there. It's my decision. And, um, I, I think we need to be open-minded to it. But I, I would say the company is going to have a, a hard sell because beekeepers are an opinionated lot of people and they are very practical as beekeepers and they are very um, suspicious or not very warming to sometimes science. They're, they're not warmed up to science as much as uh, probably we should be. Uh, um, science is interesting. Science has failed us at times and scientists science has saved us at times so i don't think we can throw it out right but i think beekeepers i've heard beekeepers say things like well uh you know all this stuff that's been done in, on bees and all these ideas why are bees no better off why are bees dying at the same rate as they've always died like in the winter and so forth none of this science is working and i've thought the same thing before i've, I've weighed that same thought but then if you, who knows, right? Because if science wasn't there, if we weren't doing some of the things we're doing now to save bees, would our dieouts be 80% every year? Yeah. Would bees be gone? You know, we, that's not really a fair way to evaluate it. Um, I think people want answers. They want fast answers. But at the same time, I think science has helped us a lot. But on the other hand, if you follow science, what, I think what people don't like about science is that science constantly has to be updated and it has to be improved or changed. And some people feel like science, when they, when they make a claim, it should never be wrong and it should never have to be updated. And that's just not science at all. 
We have to constantly think about, wait a minute, a new study shows this. And we have to be open to that. And that kind of makes us mad because, wow, the old study, we all did it that way, right? Mm. I hear people say, you know, back in the day, everybody liked butter. We ate butter. And then somebody said, oh, butter is bad for you, bad for your heart, you know, cholesterol or whatever. And so let's, let's eat margarine. So they fabricated a fake butter. <laughs> and so people got off butter and ate margarine for a while. And then, uh-oh, new studies show butter is not all that bad for you. Uh, in in reasonable amounts. And then same way with eggs, right? There was a moment where eggs got a bad name. Oh, eggs are bad for you, raise your cholesterol. Seems like now eggs are really good for you. You know, eggs are something you can eat good. I think people get frustrated. Like they, we say they are saying, they are telling us now, but they told us then. But I think we need to be open and say, wait, science is that way. We, we learn more information. We have more studies being done. We have better ways of measuring things. You know, studies that were done in the 50s and 40s didn't have the instruments that we have today. So now yeah. we have better instruments to make better decisions that may change the data. But then that's new science that we say, okay, good, that's cool. That's, that's, that's interesting to, to think of it that way. And I think beekeeping has a lot of science behind it now, which it didn't always have. And that's really refreshing. We go to a lot of conferences, Grayson and we hear people talk that are scientists and beekeeping um, and we hear about their studies and it's it's pretty uh, it, it's I think it's pretty rewarding to hear that that much work is being done on the honeybee yeah I think the same thing because you know you got all you know you're, you're different people who are you know you know experimenting you know you have you know new um, like treatments you know like you know like, like what we we're just talking about you know like people say you know, like a, lot of, like a long time ago, it was easy, you know, back in the 90s. But, you know, I think the same thing is that, you know, a while back, it was easier because we didn't have, you know, the Varroa mite. They came in late. You know, I think, you know, yeah. I think all that as well. Well, but, you know, it. I would say uh, I wasn't keeping bees. Uh, I didn't have a lot of experience with bees prior to the Varroa mite. But I will say when reading in the literature of like Reverend Langstroff, when he lived in Ohio and in the north, uh, he was losing a lot of hives in the winter and he was trying to find ways to keep those hives alive. That's pre Varroa mite. And so they had, they still had their issues with, you know, not every, not every bee, not every bee colony survived. And um, there's probably data out there to show us how many bees, bees were dying in the, in the winter, but he had problems. He was trying to put his bees in his basement and, uh, and digging holes in the ground and everything. So um, yes, but I think it is harder now to, uh, to battle some of these diseases and pests that we have, you know, we didn't have small high beetle in the U S and, and uh, now we do. So we have beetles and, and beetles can track around viruses too, a little bit. And, you know, we just have these things that are, that are more challenging. Uh, we have less foraging for bees to fly on, to fly to, to get uh, good nutrition, a variety of nutrition. So there's a lot working against the bee, but, and I think we're we're trying to match up the science that can fill us in on what we need to do to strengthen our bees at the same time. Yeah, I think the same thing. I guess the next um, topic, I got, I just got a few more topics that will, you know, wrap it up. I mean, is uh, um, what we're just talking, we talked a little about it, not, not much, is about winter moisture. I know you've um, talked about it in the past. So I was wondering if we could talk a little about that, you know, uh, in your experience with, you know, winter moisture and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. When I was um, first trying to figure out how to get more bees to survive my Illinois prairie uh, land winter, I would inspect my bees, the ones that perished, I would inspect them and do a kind of a diagnosis of, you know, why do they, what do they die from? And every one of them that I was amazed at the amount of uh, liquid moisture that was in the hive, either in the comb, on the frames, on the comb, or on the top covers, on the walls of the wood and everything. The mold, the mildew that would grow inside that colony was telling me there were way too much moisture. Um, I might have been using bot solid bottom boards back then, probably, but I think I was. But um, So I just figured out, what do I do to get the moisture out? You know, I did a little bit of studying, and I realized that moisture develops uh, you know, bees produce moisture in the hive, but there's a lot of moisture that develops on the top of the hive in the top area of the hive from condensation. So when you have two contrasting temperatures of hot and cold, the moisture develops on the warm side of that contrasting temperature. Think of it like this. If you had a nice 
glass of iced tea on a hot summer day, the outside edge of the, of the glass, it's warm. It's on the warm side. So it has all that condensation dripping down the side of the glass. <laughs> so same way in my hives, I did uh, some photography work back then. I would take pictures. I would go in there in the wintertime of a living colony. I would raise up my inner cover and I would see about a quarter inch to a half inch of frost uh, that where the moisture collected on my inner cover above the brood nest area and it and it was liquid but it would drip down and freeze it was forming frost or icicles inside the colony and then on a warm day that that water that ice would thaw out and drip down into the comb into my bees making way too much moisture and so that's when I went to work on making a lot of different devices that I could get rid of that moisture out of the hive and uh, I was just really sick and tired of all that mold and mildew inside my colonies. So that's when I worked with a lot of different ways of getting moisture out. I, I devised pipes and, you know, um, I guess I was experimenting with uh, different fabric that could absorb moisture, or get it out of the hive. And I came up with some really cool, neat ideas. But finally, when I just decided, oh, my gosh, I need to feed them also, that's all it was you know, hitting two birds with one stone. I could feed my bees with hard candy, but that's not really real hard. And then the moisture would make it even softer for them to consume. That's right. And then when they consume the candy, it makes heat. They, they get warmer when they eat that candy. So, um, wow. I, I just felt like that was finally my answer to how to deal with my moisture problem. But it, it is a problem in some areas where there's a lot of moisture in the air. But my case was we have dry winters usually, but it's the con it's the difference in temperature that's making the moisture in the hive. I think same thing, you know, I think same, you know, concept of, you know, different, trying different experiments with, you know, moisture dealing with it. Cause you know, usually, you know, Northern States do get a little more drier, you know, especially down here, we have a lot of rain, you know, like we had rain just a few days ago, like especially like, you know, in this, what is it, January? Or in January, it's raining. It's, you know, we have a lot of mildew, condensation. So it, we do have a little more, you know, moisture problem. Yeah. So, you know, so, you know, what I do is, you know, I try to nickel trick, like, you know, you know, that's all you do on one of your videos. I try that, mm -hmm. you know, just to, yeah. you know, experiment with it. It worked. Um, yeah. I showed a, um, also, you know, did like, you know, a homemade, like a homemade, what do you, like a quilt box, like a homemade one, like with free simple things, fabric. Yeah. Yep. Um, you could use an inner cover, put screen on it. Um, anything, something like that that has a hole, put screen on it, put a roof on top, you know, and yeah. that's like your homemade quilt box. That I showed that, you know, I've yeah. used that, right. you know, it works pretty good as well. So yeah. different ways to, you know, work off what you have. Yeah, that's right. I, I think uh, the backyard beekeeper uh, can have a lot of fun being a citizen scientist. You know, I, I think sometimes beekeepers are too hard on themselves. They say, oh, I don't know anything. I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not an experienced beekeeper. I'm brand new to this, but you know, Hey, uh, don't think of it that way. Look at it. Like um, m most people, even like Reverend Langstroff, he came up with the idea of the Langstroff hive. He, he was really good with bees. If you read his uh, work and his books, uh, he was, he was so intelligent about bees for his time. And I think he was a pastor. And so he, he wasn't known to be a bee scientist and entomologist of his day or anything, but he just spent so much time studying bees. And I think the backyard beekeeper needs to be a scientist, citizen scientist where they can go out there. But one of the things that we have at our disposal, which is really good, Grayson, is we have a very, very cheap, inexpensive um, devices that we can purchase to monitor our hives. And that's what I've done with a lot of my bees. I'll just buy these $5 temperature moisture gauges at Walmart or something and throw them in the hive. And a lot of these hook up to your phone or something. You can get a Bluetooth reading on what the moisture level is. So any, any beekeeper for under 20 bucks could buy something and monitor moisture in their hive on their cell phone. And um, that's kind of cool to think about. And then they could experiment with, okay, maybe I'll make a quilt box. Now, did that bring my moisture level down? Let me look at my phone. Isn't that cool to think of? I mean, yeah. I, I just think we, we, don't, we don't have to have a big laboratory and have, you know, 100 control colonies. And uh, it's, I just think it'd be fun for beekeepers to experiment. And then they might find some ways that they can learn something about their area and their bee and the moisture in the hive and, and how they deal with the moisture. I, I think it's really cool. I think same thing. Cause you know, 
I tried, you know, a few things, even though like I have like five colonies, you know, you can still do small experiments. Oh, yeah. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. It's always, you know, you don't have to have all this fancy, you know, equipment. You can, you know, like you said, like get a moisture reader. You know, they have many things online and stores, Walmart, all that different kind of stuff. You know, they have different yeah. read, readers that you can read your temp temperatures, your uh, your moisture, and you can just, you know, see if your your like you said, like if the moisture went down with your uh, homemade quilt box or with mm -hmm. you know the nickel trick, you know, or that both combined. Mm -hmm. I think it's good, you know, to be able to, you know, have that way of you know experimenting with things, even though even if you're a backyard beekeeper. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you look at the literature of beekeeping and most people that came up with what some of the things we're using today, they were backyard beekeepers trying to think of a uh, of a great way to solve a problem, right? And so they yeah. solved a problem. And, and as a result of that, it is something that we still use today. And yeah. they were just citizen scientists, beekeepers that had great ideas. Yeah, I think same thing. But I guess the um, last topic and then... Um, we'll end it off is one thing that you've been talking a little about and on your channel I've been seeing is raising queens. I wonder if you could um, briefly, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the art um, and the joy and maybe a little bit of your experience of raising queens. That's a really uh, great uh, question, Grayson. I like the way you put it. Uh, you know, for a while, I was going to try to make a living off honey. I, I wanted to quit my other career, need to get out of it. It was uh, much too uh, painful and stressful and conflictive for me to be involved in that. And I needed to do something different. And I didn't have any other, didn't have much other where to go. And so uh, I was keeping bees and I thought maybe I could make a living off selling honey. And I, that was real frustrating because um, there were some years that I, made a lot of honey, but then there are other years that I just could, you know, it was a bad, bad year or something. And, um, I really didn't start out raising Queens to make money. I started raising Queens because I was tired of paying money for Queens. <laughs> I didn't like giving my, my little money I had away. So I decided if I could just raise Queens for myself, I could save me a truckload of money. So that's when I started learning how to raise queens. And so I spent a lot of time studying it, reading books, you know, going to some conferences. Uh, this would have probably been, I don't know, early, early 2000, I guess. But started figuring out ways uh, like to, to raise queens. I couldn't find good answers. I just really couldn't. So I was at a conference where I heard Joe Latshaw, uh, who was raising breeder queens in Ohio. And I thought, that guy knows what he's talking about. And I thought, I'm just going to call him up and say, what, what, what can I do for you to teach me how to raise Queens? I'll pay you whatever. He invited me, my couple of my older children over to learn Queen rearing. He spent the day with us in, in his house in his backyard, taught us how to raise Queens. I, I don't, I don't remember if I paid him. I tried to pay him, but I don't think he took any money, but it was, that's where I learned to, uh, to raise Queens. And, that's when I started raising queens and I found it to be so entertaining, so, so much fun. It was so enlightening to me. And it not only helped my operation to have these queens at my disposal, but I could tweak the genetics a little bit to what I thought was a better queen. And then I could also uh, replace and expand my operation and sell more nucleuses raising queens. So it was just a big push for me to raise my own queens. But then I got the idea of like, well, I don't think I, I don't, I don't remember ever having a business model where I said, I want to sell this many Queens a day or a week. But I think what happened probably was a beekeeper probably was over here saying, I need a queen. Do you have one? Well, I probably did. You know, I probably had a queen in a mating box there that was about ready to go into a production box. But, and I said, well, yeah, I do. And he probably offered me $30 or something. And all at once I thought that was an easy $30. <laughs> so I, I think it was kind of serendipity that I ever got to into selling Queens. It, I don't, I don't recall ever thinking I wanted to be a queen seller. So, but it was, it was sort of like easy money for me because I was already raising Queens and I could just expand it and, have extra queens to sell. And it didn't take long at all, word of mouth. I wasn't really heavily on the internet then, but word of mouth, man, I, I started selling so many queens. And then we, after we got more established on the internet, it was easy to put queens online um, and start selling them that way. So um, 
I, I didn't ever find, I have yet to find queen rearing to be frustrating. I think when I was selling at my maximum level, which I've backed way down from, but when I was selling about a hundred queens a week, um, that was really stressful because we were shipping them. And that number of queens required a lot of mating nooks to be healthy. It required a lot of grafting and it required a lot of interaction with customers. Um, and so once I found that I, it's a little easier to sell a lot of queens to one person than it is to sell a lot of uh, uh, one queen to a lot of people. So it's, it's more difficult for me now to find joy in shipping out a lot of queens uh, to different customers. I think it's a great service. Uh, I'd like to see somebody else do it. So I ventured out by securing people in my area that I went to and said, would you raise queens for me? Here's where I, I started with my son-in-law. I taught him how to raise queens for me. He would raise the queens, bring them over here. We'd ship them out. Whew, that relieved me. I'm getting old. I don't like being out in the hot sun all that long. So then I had another guy that was a commercial beekeeper. He said he raised queens for me. I had a bee inspector here in Illinois. She said she'd raise queens for me. All at once, you know, I'm losing a little profit because they're, you know, I'm paying them to raise queens or they're keeping some of the money, whatever. But um, it worked out where it was a relief for me to kind of pass on the way I wanted my queens to be raised. And then they were still, I felt my queens, but I didn't have to do entirely all the work. Yeah, I think same thing. You know, I haven't, I'm thinking about starting queen running this year. I'm going to try it out, you know, maybe do some experimenting with it. Maybe we do videos on it, maybe just depends, you know, depends if I have the time, which I should. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And the, those little bees, when, when it comes to queen rearing, you know, we have schedules in our books. We, you know, John Zavishlak and I wrote the book, uh, Qual Raising Quality Queens. And we've got a schedule in the back of what bees do on what days, raising queens when you move things around. It's amazing how those bees follow that schedule. I mean, it is so cool. And so since bees are on that tight schedule, you know, uh, it's so easy just to follow their schedule. And so yeah. it's just as easy as pie. I mean, day 13 or 14, I can move those queen cells out of, out of my finishing hive into wherever boxes that need queens or mating nooks. And on day 14, I can just figure I can go out there and move those. And it, it works like, I mean, perfect all the time. And you can expect those, those queens are going to emerge on day 16. They're going to get out there mated, come back, start laying in a week or so. And, it's just clockwork. So it was easy. It's like having a paper route. I mean, it was just, it's just something that I think you'll really enjoy it. I hope you do, Grace. And I, I think I we, need, we need more people to do that. And you're young and you can continue to perfect that. And I think it'd be really good. Yeah. yeah I think so too. Cause you know, it's good to have, you know, like same with us, like whenever we started on beekeeping, we thought we could make a lot of money with honey, but you know, that really didn't turn out the way, you know, like we didn't, you know, some years, like you said, would we'd have a lot of honey. What some years we just have one bucket full of honey, and we, yeah. would, you know, and this we're, this is what we were talking about last week when we had a, I've never guessed on was how fast honey goes. Like you know, like we had like fifty mm -hmm. bottles of honey. It went through. It, it was gone within like a week or two, and then after that, you know, more people were running it, but we were sold out of it. You know, mm -hmm. we said, mm -hmm. you know, then that year, you know, we have a lot of honey to sell. The next year, we may have less, so we can't sell it. So event for it and i think it's good to have like never streams of income like you know you have queen rearing you can sell your honey maybe make nukes packages you know different things you know yeah. to make money maybe selling bee halves if you're you know you're big enough yep that's, that's really right good to have different streams of income yeah absolutely that's that's a really good thinking that's right um i, I think at one time i uh, the most times i had on this property we we use uh, and collaborate with other beekeepers on on other bees on other pieces of the property. But the most I ever had here that I worked single handedly was about a hundred. And at that time, that's when I was trying to make as most honey I, out of, that I could out of those hundred colonies. So you can imagine, um, I, I had all the equipment. I had automatic automatic uh, extractors and uncapping machines, and I had a five hundred gallon. Uh, it was like a, I forget what they call them now, but it was like a, a milk uh, tank that was lined in the middle with heat. And so he could keep your honey a little bit warm, you know, and uh, man, I would keep that thing filled up with, I had pumps pumping honey everywhere. And that was just so much of a doggone hard job. I'll tell you that. And, you know, it's not without all these machines breaking down. I've got kids, my family's working these machines and operating things and moving things around. 
quite an elaborate system that I put together in, in doing this, but I had big winches that would hoist up buckets of wax and drip them. And, um, but I just, I, that's when I started moving towards queen rearing and I had those hundred colonies and I believe it or not, I started, when I started raising and selling Queens, I started without a lot of mating nooks. I just started using those hundred colonies. Wasn't the best way to do it, but I needed money. So I would, if somebody bought a queen, I'd go out there and take one out of one of those big colonies and yeah. sell my queen. And of course, it, they would raise their own. And in another month, I'd have a replacement queen, but I really couldn't take her because I needed brood, you know. So I just kind of worked my way up and figured out, okay, and I need to make mating nooks. And yeah, it was just, um, for me, it was just a good experience. I never did anything that was a heavy, uh, I guess, a plan. I never was thinking that this is my goal or my plan to do this. It was always just something that I got to in my end of my rope on one thing that either wasn't working or I was tired of it and I needed another option. And I started searching what's another option. So it, I felt like my bee business that I've ran and was always like a car that you're trying to get from New York to California. And every time the car breaks down, <laughs> you'd pull over on the side of the road and try to see what you could do to fix it, whether you use part of a bob wire fence to hook your muffler back up or you try to get a neighbor to pour a little water in the radiator. I, I was just always in a desperate kind of survival mode trying to make this thing fly, raising a big family. But I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I, I learned from, I learned the hard way and it was, uh, it's been a really good journey for me and I'm still learning. I, I every, every day I spend hours actually uh, studying bees and studying literature about bees, learning about the new data that's come out. So it is uh, beekeeping and learning about bees is uh, a vital part of my life and my passion, my love for bees. I have a real love for new beginners. I really do because I, I was a new beginner for a long time. I know what they go through. It can be real frustrating. So to me, I, I always say I'm like one beggar telling another beggar where the food is. Yeah. And that's kind of really all I am. Like, yeah, because whenever I started beekeeping, you know, like whenever, I don't know, I've said the story, so I'm not going to really um, say too much of it. But, um, you know, whenever we started, you know, we started, you know, we watched YouTube and that's about it. Um, and then right when we got in beekeeping, you know, we got a few books. And after that, you know, read a little bit right when we started. But then right when we started, because whenever we started, we thought it was going to be easy. Like many people would think, you know, it's going to be so easy, you know, like especially like, you know, if you look behind screens it looks easy but whenever you're out there it's actually you know work you know it's you know good to, you yeah. know but that's whenever we started you know we never but then after that you know i've been keeping bees about four years about 2019 and, and then you know i'm still learning still stuff but i know a lot of you know things you know throughout those past few years i've kept bees so i think it's good yeah you know it when you start beekeeping at first it is easy only because you don't know what you need to know you don't sure. know that you need to know more and so you have this little bit of information you know oh how do you install a package and maybe you know what all the different parts are called you know and so it seems kind of easy all you got to do is get a hive throw bees in a box and kind of watch them give them room to grow and so it is easy but then you start learning that there's more to it and that's when it gets hard <laughs> when, when you start getting more experience and you have more questions like i thought this was going to be easy why are my bees doing this what is that you know why does it look like this then you realize it's hard because you realize you need to know more and it becomes you you become to you come to realize that i don't know as much as i need to know and so you can you can never end you you can learn about bees till the day you die and and always feel like you don't know anything about them I mean, if you just start drilling down into the anatomy of a honeybee, all the way down the, yeah. to the Malpighian tubules, and that's why bees don't uh, pee because they have Malpighian tubules. So, you know, you can just drill down into the anatomy of the honeybee until you're just like, wow, this is so neat that it seems like bees have these have a mechanism in their digestive where they kind of basket up their poop and this basket gets rid of the poop farm and they make a new basket around the poop. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> when, when do you ever stop learning about bees and why they yeah. do things? It's crazy. But I think there, you reach a point where you have to say, I know a lot about bees enough to be a good beekeeper, 
but I want to keep learning because I, I want to learn more to, because it's enjoyable. I like learning more about bees. I don't really have to know more, but I want to know more because it's enjoyable. Yeah, I think same thing. I got a few. We got a few uh, questions here. We will end this thing off. Okay. So first one is from Jason Egan. He says, "Do you think it's possible to love your beast too much?" I got into the hive again today. Put another one of David's candy boards on my hive. It's about every two, three weeks in Utah. Okay, that's good to know, Jason. Can you love your bees too much? Yeah, you can. You you can love anything too much. Only yeah, if you're yeah. supposed to be loving something else more. So in other words, if you're married and you you love your bees more than your wife, that doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe it might be something that you need to stop loving so much. Like it's more productive that you love your bees more than you love the old truck that's finally rusting away and you're tired of putting money in it. Maybe you need to shift gears and start putting that time into your, into your bees rather than the old truck that needs to just go to the salvage yard. So it just all depends. Now, yeah. I think the, I think the true, uh, I, I think what he's really asking is I'm, I'm kind of passionate. I'm kind of really like engulfed with all this bee information. I can't get enough of it. Am I obsessed with bees? Is this a problem? And again, if you're if you're living a balanced life, I think that's really important that um, we can live too much in our bees. I, I I did. I I'll say, Jason, and I'll be honest with my with our viewers that there was a time when I worked um, 16, 18 hours a day, either building hives for sale, making queens, at the expense of when I should have spent more time with my family or relaxing, not or you know being more. Um, enjoying life more. I got in and I see beekeepers today. I see people starting bee businesses and I, I can't say anything because I, nobody could have told me anything different, but I want to go to them and say, Oh, you're missing the mark. You're, you're going to pour all your time and energy into the, into your bee business. And sometimes we don't realize we're not making as much money in our bee business. The cash flow looks good, but the bottom line is we're not bringing in that much money. So you're working yourself crazy on all these projects and, trying to meet the demand of all the beekeepers who are very demanding. But then at the same time, you probably need to put your love toward your family, helping others, uh, taking care of yourself. That's, that's good. So if you love your bees more than you love yourself or your family, you're loving them too much. That's my personal opinion for me. Yeah, I think the same thing. Now we got one here. I like to hear about his David's YouTube channel, high lows, turning points, changes, he's made to expand his audience? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I started beekeeping and then I wrote, wrote a blog. My blog is still up, by the way. And I, re I read my blog that I started writing a couple of decades ago. And I <laughs> think some of the information is wrong that I thought or said, but what can you do? You know, I was learning. Yeah. But same with my beekeeping videos. Uh, anybody who goes back and starts watching me from the beginning, not only will they see a younger man, but they'll see a man that um, was searching and trying to learn about bees. And I was telling people what I learned and what worked back then. And I've grown, I've changed. I've, I've, I don't always hold to the same things that I probably said back then because I've, I've improved. But, um, as far as the audience goes forever, my, my channel really didn't have much of a following. Um, I didn't make that many videos very often. I wasn't consistent. I knew nothing about YouTube other than I took a cheap little video camera and tried to put something online. But it wasn't until about, oh, 2019, 2020, around that area that I decided I might start making a few more videos. And then about 2020, uh, about COVID 2020, 2021, uh, what happened for me was I made a few videos and some of those went really strong. They had, you know, 30, 40,000 uh, views within a few days. And I was shocked. My some, some people told me I wasn't really watching the numbers, but this video is going crazy, dad. You know, one of my daughters told me, I was like, really? And I looked at it. So then I decided, yeah, maybe I need to take this a little more serious. I bought a camera and I bought a dedicated camera. And, um, my subscription started growing faster and faster and momentum wise. And so then I started hearing what people for a long time, a lot of people won't know this, but when YouTube was early and I was on YouTube early, I got 
and it wasn't from beekeepers, but I got a lot of negative comments. And back then YouTube wasn't policing it much and people would just cuss me out that, you know, just for, for the, they were bored or something. So I had to turn my comments off. I wasn't saying anything bad or controversial. They were just, it was just that kind of trolling, you know? So I turned my comments off for a year or two. And then I finally decided to turn them back on to help people. But what I, what I've found now is I'm, I've kind of got a passion for helping people through my YouTube channel. I, I, I go to bed at night and every night when I go to bed, I, I lay down and I to kind of help myself go to sleep. I sleep easily go to sleep easily, but I'll start by saying, what would be a good YouTube uh, video tomorrow if I was like a new beginner or if this was my second or third year, what do I want to know? <laughs> so I would, I always keep notepads by me. Um, I have hundreds and thousands of ideas about videos that I want to make. I, it's amazing. I, I don't believe this to be true, but I'm going to say it. Uh, it's almost like somebody else is telling me to help beekeepers what to make a video on. I, I don't know how to say that. I, I don't really believe that somebody is feeding me information, the universe or whatever. I, you know, I can't say no, I can't say yeah, but it's, I come up with these ideas that are beyond me. Maybe that's what I should say. I, 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 I'm not capable of coming up with these ideas of these videos, but after I make a video, um, I'm kind of like, I can't believe that all that fell together. I don't know where all that came from. I, that, I'm not saying I impressed myself, but it it was a better video than I could create. So I don't know what to say about that, but I, it, other than I really love doing it. Yeah. And and I think the the people that leave comments and watch my channel, subscribe, they're the ones who are kind of like, you know, pumping me up to to continue to do this. And I, I love it. I it's a it's a astonishing work to be involved in. I feel like um, I'm reaching a lot of people and I, that that I'm glad to see that I can take what I've learned and help other people. Absolutely. I think, I think that's great. You know, like, you know, there's a lot of people now, you know, like newer beekeepers online looking for things so then they can actually find, you know, somebody who knows that good stuff. So I think it's good. Yeah. The, the problem I have that I struggle with the most is I, I don't want to be giving the false impression that if you watch me, you'll know everything about bees because I don't have the capability in my YouTube channel to really thoroughly educate somebody on beekeeping. Um, it would, I would lose too many viewers uh, because like, again, it's, it, you can get too in depth in science and get way down in the weeds. Right. So I play this delicate balance of, I want to say enough to really get people excited about getting into bees. Um, but if you wanted somebody to become an airplane pilot, I don't think you would take them up on their first flight and do acrobats and rolls and outside rolls and inside, you know, it's just going to make them throw up and never want to fly again. <laughs> so I feel like in my videos, I have to entertain a little bit, but I also have to give them enough information like my queen ring videos I've made. I want them to get into queen ring, but I want them to learn a lot on their own away from me. I want to spark them and I want them to learn enough from me that, gets them into the basics, but I want them to go beyond me and get into their own research like I had to do or take a college course or something or take a local bee club or take one of my classes. I want them to get into the fundamentals. I just don't feel like I'm doing anybody anything good if I give them the false impression that yesterday's video is all they need to keep bees. Yeah. That, that kind of scares me. I want them to take what I'm telling them I really want each video to be something that um, like if you're an experienced person who can run, uh, mow your yard, for example, you've got a push mower or a riding mower and you know how to mow your yard. But let's say you have a problem with your mower and it's the, the maybe it's a carburetor or something. I like to make a little video on how to how to clean out your carburetor if you get some old gas in there. Yeah. That's kind of what my videos are. I, I can't tell you how to steer it. I can't tell you how, what depth in your area to set the mower blade, right? I can't make videos that tell you every nuance of mowing your grass, but I want to make enough videos that you can find one that answers a question that you're stuck on right now. And I yeah. think that's cool. When do I use a queen excluder? Well, you don't always have to, but if the queen keeps getting up the super, throw, in a, throw a queen excluder in there. Yeah, I think that's, that's good. Not, but that's not basic. That's not the fundamentals that people need to have ahead of time. Yeah, I think same thing. 
Well, I guess I better go ahead and end this thing. Okay, great. It's been fun. Yeah, it was very fun. Thank you, David, for uh, coming on. I, I appreciate it very much. Well, let me tell you, Grayson, keep up what you're doing. I, I, I hope I see, I see a passion in you. You're very inspired on YouTube and you're, you're, uh, you and your brother is your brother named Vincent. That's right. Vincent. Yeah. You and you and your brother, you both have an excellent presence in front of people. Uh, it, you're both very inspiring and you both are, uh, I think everybody that in the beekeeping community that watches you guys are sitting there going, Wow. I'm not sure what to do with these people. I mean, they're really good and they're so young, you know? <laughs> so uh, youth has a way of uh, motivating and helping older people. So I'm encouraged by you. I really am. I want you to, it, it would really break my heart. It would sadden me greatly if you ever reduced your, your um, YouTube channel or stopped making videos. So yeah. stay in there. I, I think it's great. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I'm going to try to keep it up, you know, keep these live streams going as much as I can. Absolutely. Yep. So Absolutely. I think that's great. Well, thank you, David, for coming on. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Grayson. Good night, everybody. Good night. See you later. You bet. <laughs>